Awesome. This panel almost didn't happen. You would be going home early. All right, are we all ready here? Okay, um, so I'm Karina. Hi. I left uh, behind 17 plus years in the world of corporate in order to fight climate change. And now I'm at Central St. Martins where I'm doing an MA and researching how a digital object can affect physical change. And I'm doing that as an artist behind Las Palmas Doradas. Next month at Free Sculpture Park, you can experience virtual sculpture uh, in partnership with Mirage AR over there. And I'm also a founder and community builder behind Emergence with Gen Z on the end, which is a climate community focused on taking people away from screens and into nature. And today, I'm super excited to be guiding a climate conversation with fellow brilliant agents of change. Please introduce yourselves. So I'm Stephen Bazayo. I spent maybe 10 to 12 years working in, in coffee trying to find the, the best way to manage coffee from where we consume it and where it grows. And we found that it's a long path and getting people to actually care about something that's a long way away is difficult. And it became more about the money. So I leave working coffee to try and help nonprofits near where I was buying coffee. <laughs> and predominantly that's all near the ocean, not solely, but often. And so I started just taking pictures for nonprofits, and that helped a lot. It was a really good way to get them awareness and get them a little bit of funding. I'll just move on. Hi, hello. Um, I'm Kalpana. I'm a few different things. I'm a technologist, I'm a climate activist, but I'm also an ecosomatics educator. I'm the founder of Nowadays on Earth, which is a social enterprise advocating for contact with nature in the digital age and growing environmental justice um, through different means. Currently, we're working on uh, tech policy and green equity in urban spaces and getting people um, within cities to connect with nature um, and using diff different digital innovative technologies to get that to happen. So. Hi everyone, my name is Christina. I'm uh, one of the founders of a company called Dovo Earth. I'm a lawyer by trade, uh, but also I'm a very proud descendant of a farming family. Um, and this leads very nicely into what our product does. We've built an audit trail, uh, which eliminates the need of intermediaries within the carbon market spaces, whilst at the same time um, enables um, and helps the farmers um, to so sell those carbon um, credits that they create within their spaces. Um, and we um, have created a voluntary carbon market um, space for those individuals where we create digital NFTs and actually all the proceeds goes to the farmers. So it's really great to be here and I'm looking forward to sticking in the conversation. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Radoslav Dragov. Uh, I'm head of validation for the Open Forest Protocol. Um, the Open Forest Protocol allows anyone anywhere to gain value from their land by planting trees, uh, submit data about their project and get it communally, communally verified on a blockchain. Um, and on my previous job, I was um, head of the European Blockchain Research Division of IDC, which is a consulting company. And I work, I work with a bunch of large organizations, including the European Commission, and really glad to be here. Awesome. All right, let's begin. So the mainstream narrative about Web3 and environmental impact has been squarely about energy consumption. You've heard the stories. And you also may have heard the good news last week. The merge happened, finally. Ethereum overnight uh, reduced its electricity use by 99.99%. Um, and apparently they were using a quarter of a percent of all world's energy consumption. So that's pretty good. Uh, they also reduced their carbon emissions by 99.98% according to the Crypto Carbon Ratings Institute. So that's amazing. It only took them a couple of years, which may seem like eternity in the crypto world. But if you look at the real world, this is extremely fast, extremely efficient, and it did the job. 
So the blockchain community has something to celebrate, one can say. However, it's not all about energy use. It's also about emissions. And the story is, or the sad reality, is that the emissions have been steadily climbing despite conversations about uh, net zero, countries making sweeping statements, companies making all sorts of promises and whatnot. So the reality uh, is you know, slightly different, which means there's a great need for more and more climate solutions. And today we're gonna chat about how Web3 is trying to deliver uh, on some of those solutions, um, empowering communities, unlocking climate financing, and doing more regenerative good for the planet and the people. Exciting? <laughs> Come on, some energy, guys. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So my first question is for Rado. So Rado, please tell us, what problem are we trying to solve and how is Web3 trying to do that? Thank you. Well, the big problem is uh, climate change. And uh, I, I come from uh, Web3 and going into uh, climate change. Well, at first, the problem seems overwhelming because we not only have to cut our CO2 emissions, but we also have to draw down carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and the best way to do so is by planting more trees. Now, there's a mechanism, a market mechanism that incentivizes planting more trees, which in essence is companies pay for other people around the world to plant trees, and in exchange they get carbon credits, which can be used to offset their carbon footprint. But this mechanism hasn't produced the necessary results. We have to plant one trillion trees by 2030. Um, and the main problem is, I would say the main bottleneck is the lack of accessible MRV. And I don't want to hit you with acronyms <laughs> at this uh, stage in the day, but MRV means measurement, reporting, and verification. And in very simple terms is if you have a reforestation project and you want to access a value from that project that could be in the form of carbon credits, then you need to send a third party that goes on the ground, collects data, verifies the information, uh, and then certifies the results. Uh, currently, with the legacy system, this is very painful. This is slow, bureaucratic process, not to mention very expensive, uh, which means that only very few, the largest of large projects, can get access to MRV, which lives the majority of landowners in the world with no ways to access um, value from their land by restoring it. And we at the Open Forest Protocol decided to leverage new technology, not just Web3, but also satellite imagery, and make the whole process much more accessible uh, to, again, as I said in the beginning, allow anyone anywhere who wants to replant their land to get value out of it. And with us, there are no size limits and there are no fees. Um, so you can just get started. Uh, in fact, if you have a couple of hectares, doesn't matter anywhere, you can just download our app. When you reforest the land, then you start submitting data about this reforestation project on a regular basis. Um, and that information goes through a decentralized network of validators. Now, these are not the blockchain validators that you know. These are very specialized companies. We have satellite companies, refor um, sorry, forestry companies, um, environmental organizations, which their job is to audit that data and make sure that it's correct so they can either reject or certify that data. And the great thing is using Web3 is the whole process is transparent and publicly available. So by creating this decentralized system of validators, we've in essence democratized um, the access to MRV. Um, and to, to, put it, uh, to put it in uh, blockchain terms, uh, planting trees and using OFP is a bit like, um, a bit like mining for Bitcoin, but in this case, you're mining the air for carbon, which is actually a valuable commodity. So you're getting a steady, steady stream of income and you're restoring the land. So in this case, both the people and the environment wins. Thank you. I love that OFP brings power to the people and drives uh, fiscal resilience. 
So climate, as I'm sure you've heard, is a very, very complex topic. We'll need a lawyer. So my next question <laughs> is for Christina. Given your legal background, can you please tell us about what solutions Web3 is trying to bring to the legacy system that has been permeating for decades now? Um, sure, I'm going to try to answer that um, because the reality is that there is no right or wrong answer at this stage of where the, the carbon space is as a whole. Um, just looking firstly um, within the Web3 space um, and, and thinking about why it was created, it was to break boundaries, it was to break business models, it was to create new ones. We've all heard that. Um, when we've looked at how the carbon market spaces operate nowadays, we've seen a, a massive problem. Although it's fairly new-ish industry, it's still so, so bad because we have the intermediaries. Um, and as very recently the Salesforce head of sustainability said, there's no trust, there's no um, transparency within the carbon market spaces. Um, and, and if we look at, as to how the actual industry works, we have those intermediaries which are sat in the middle and they are going to the big corporations and they're saying, hey, you need to offset your carbon offsets because very often the regulation says so, specifically in the States nowadays, and it's, it's coming to Europe, um, but not there yet. Um, and um, the same intermediaries then go back to suppliers and say, okay, so we're gonna sell your carbon credits. The problem there is that the supply side ends up getting probably around 40% of the proceeds that the big corporations are paying for the carbon credits. And instead of actually helping them, they're profiting from the service, so-called service that they're providing. Um, a recent study of McKinsey says that by 2030, on the lower end, the carbon markets have the uh, ability to get to 3 billion. And on the higher end, that can get up to 50 billion. So we have a massive market opportunity there for those intermediaries. And, and you can see why it's so important for them to actually be controlling the, those trades. And looking at that whole system and, and how broken it is, we decided that we need to break it. We need to utilize and innovate and use technology. And yes, it is exciting, the Web3 space, but also um, it's, it's very new. So all of us are learning. And in a similar fashion that Brado just described, we are breaking down the barriers when it comes to following the so-called global protocols stemming from um, companies like the Gold Standard and Vera, because at the end of the day, they're also for-profit organizations, organizations which are creating their standards based on their rules and also taking profits for the standards that they, they've created from those different organizations and projects. So with what we've created, we're actually removing the intermediaries, we're removing that complexity and we're allowing for, in our specific case, the farmers have that 100% money being sent straight to them and no fees being charged on the intermediaries. We also have the visibility, the transparency. We utilize that um, based on the technology that we use. So at any moment in time within our audit trail, you can see when a project has been verified, what um, are the policies that they've abided by. So the supplier is very transparent and visible, but also the person or the entity that wants to purchase those credits have the choice to choose who they want to purchase it from and who do they want to support. So I think this is a very important step. And the last piece around this is around the actual credits of retirement of carbon, which is a massive problem nowadays. A lot of businesses, and especially in the Web3 space nowadays, are taking advantage of the fact that you can use the carbon credit as a utility and actually trade it, but not retire it. So although we are trying to avoid the double spend problem and we're making sure that carbon credits are retired, in reality, when we're looking into projects which are not retiring those carbon credits, they're doing exactly the same thing as the Web2 projects are doing. So we're trying to change that. It's a slow, slow process, but at the same time, very exciting and, and yeah, very hopeful for the future. And it also sounds like there's a lot of opportunity because I heard that 
all the carbon credits created after 90, between 97 and 2020 are going to be retired. So that's actually provide a very big gap in the market and uh, demand is there, but we need to figure out the mechanism. Well, moving away and toward a more abstract concept of you know, humans and technology, I have a question for Kalpana. Is there a, you know, is it possible that every human and technological endeavor can have a positive environmental impact and how? It's a very big question, but um, I'm going to actually start with the word impact there. Um, because for so many years, our kind of society, especially in the global north, has been hypnotized by the concept of carbon emissions. And the narrative has been largely controlled by fossil fuel industries. BP actually coined the phrase, your individual carbon footprint, to shift the, the blame from corporations to individuals. And the bigger question is, how can we put pressure on the corporations and actually make them take responsibility so that you know they're not just trading, which is like mind blowing, <laughs> and that they're actually retiring the credits. Um, it's actually the wealthiest 10% of the industries that are creating 50% of the world's carbon emissions, which is a ridiculous number if you think about it. So if they're continuously just trading off their credits, what are they thinking about the future for the planet? Um, so I think from a macro to micro level, we need to shift out from the perspective of, you know, how can we do less harm to how can we do more good? And that can actually have a more regenerative impact in our actions and, you know, create a just and livable world. Um, so, you know, from individuals, as an, as an individual and um, also as an extension of the individual, which are our creations, our technologies, I think it's, for me, it's a resounding yes. I think we can have and should have a positive environmental impact. It's about what narrative we're choosing to believe and how can we create new ones that actually will benefit not just our future and our current generation, but your children, your kids, your nieces, your family, your community. Um, so bringing this out to a much more worldwide perspective and really bringing communities into a kinship relationship rather than thinking about the individual self and you know your individual carbon footprint or your organizations, your company's individual carbon footprint because it's all interconnected. If climate justice and intersectionality teaches us anything is that nothing exists in silos. Um, and like you said, you know people are trading, people are reducing. So if we work as a network, I think we're able to actually create that impact that we wanna see. Thank you. And the positive messaging is key here because people tend to turn away from negative stories and, and, and you know, scary futures. And instead they need more positive, regenerative narratives. For sure. I think the media with climate doomism has a lot of that narrative as well to hold to. So I think we need to kind of think about the stories that we're telling the world and telling ourselves. Thank you. Well, going back to communities and sticking with that story. Steve, you've done some incredible work around coffee and Polynesian communities and ocean work specifically. And ocean and balance of the oceans is very important for the overall environmental balance, one can say. Can you remind us of how you used Web3 tools and technology to empower communities and what kind of effects that had? So photography for good is not a new concept. It's been around for at least 30 years. And when I first did it, I was supposed to work in, in Uganda with a refugee camp. And we raised somewhere between thirty and $50,000. I don't actually remember how much we raised, but it went through the nonprofit equivalent of, of like a GoFundMe. And by, every time, by, by the time everything was said and done, we had $2,000 to spend and we couldn't understand where all the money went. It was almost all gone and we could barely do what we were trying to do. And I had to partner up with the local university to try and get some kind of at least transportation to be saved and in exchange for my photography uh, of their little project which was actually coffee related they're they're in a place called Mityana and the coffee that they were growing I didn't know as much about it at the time and so I just took some pictures of them as they requested and then they posted it to their social media and then coincidentally through their social media uh, a buyer found them 
and the buyer was interested because they saw that I had sprayed something that was, or not I had, but they had been spraying something onto the plants that was white powdery looking stuff and they wanted to make sure that this bio certification that was what they were claiming they had was actually what it said it was. So they called, saw the images and then bought something like 180,000 kilos worth of coffee because of imagery. And just the imagery alone actually made a sale, but then the money that we raised to do nonprofit work was basically gone. And then Web3 all of a sudden says, any money that goes through this interaction, every transaction is up on whichever explorer you want to look at. If it's on Ethereum, you'll find it immediately, right? And the objective is then to take that money and say, if you gave me half an Ethereum for this project, I used a quarter of it to pay for a boat to go to where I'm going. And that's the objective for Polynesia too, because my, my backers in this case are Americans. I live in Europe and they're French Polynesians. And now we have three fully different currencies that have very different needs. And through Web3, I can demonstrate that a third went to my American, my American com compatriots, and then a third went to myself, and then a third went to this nonprofit that's effectively hosting an event to raise awareness for sea turtles in Mo'orea and, and the Gambia Islands. Like this is the objective, is that now what I'm doing is transparent and clear, and it's not the same as, I promise I'm gonna spend your money helping the community and then disappear, like a lot of photography for nonprofits and photography for good type efforts do. And Web3 really, really enables transparency and coincidentally oversight now, because a lot of the, the same certifications that you see in coffee, like rainforest certification and bio, bio certification from before, exist in these, quote, marine protected areas that we, we hear about all the time that sound great, but marine protected areas are awful far from where we live out here. So having some kind of imagery demonstrating that they are protected is, is enormously valuable, and Web3 makes that easier. Thank you. This also reminds me of uh, the one of the stats I read that for every dollar that goes through a charity project, 90% goes to admin and only 10% goes to the actual cause. So what you're telling me is that uh, Web3 can empower you know, and enable communities to receive the, the full physical benefits. So going back to communities and farmers, so continuing with this bringing Web3 to the people. Um, Christina, tell us about the importance of partnerships and approaches to engaging with these farming communities and is it difficult to educate them? You know, what is the journey of bringing them into this new technology? Well, to be frank with you, you don't need to educate farmers how to, how to farm. This is what they do, this is what they've done their whole lives. You don't actually need to educate farmers what blockchain is and what technology does. The only thing that you need to do is explain them and show them what the benefit is of the product that you're building and how that's going to impact them and, and help them. I'm not saying that that's an easy thing because the thing with farmers is that you need to gain their trust and, and that's a very difficult one when you see um, someone from technology business going over there and trying to convince them that they're gonna get some money for the work that they're already doing. So for them, in their heads, it's almost free money and they, don't, they can't grasp the, the possibility and the reality of it. Um, and, and it's almost the network effect type of thing with, with the farming communities um, that we're seeing since we've, we've went live with our platform and in the marketplace since December last year. The first farmers took like three months in general to, to have the conversations, persuade them, make sure that we're not going to steal their land because some of them were actually worried that we're going to steal their land. Uh, and following to that, there was the ripple effect, the domino effect where other farmers saw the benefit. They spoke to each other and then they start coming slowly and understanding how they can actually benefit from our platform. And this is the, the, the most favorite story that I'm probably going to remember for the rest of my life. There was a very cute farming couple um, and they had a very small farming land. Um, out, it's within Europe, but only two acres. And in total, the whole benefit for them, the whole monetary benefit for them was around 700 pounds. So for us, 700 pounds is nothing, I mean, generally speaking. Um, but for them, when I've called them and I said, look, you've sold all your carbon, we're going to transfer the money to your bank account. 
they were so happy, the wife started crying. And when I've met with them a few months later, both of the husband and the wife farming family were hugging me and crying. And they were so happy that they've received the 700 pounds, which they knew that they're going to allocate to fix their fence and plant some new trees. And there was some money allocated for the pets that they have. So it's just beautiful to see that social impact because it's not about just about the money it's not even about at this point in time how can we improve things it's about the human aspect of things and how, how can we utilize technology in a very simple way to help those communities amazing that's a so thank you for sharing that story and that's that this kind of community resilience and community support is 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 what's key and what for me web3 is has that promise we we just need to dial it up more on that note, the RADO Open Forest Protocol mainnet launch was a couple of months ago. Congratulations. Thank How you. did that go? How, what, is the, what is the result? Have you seen real world impact yet? And what is in the pipeline? Sure. Um, you know, we had our launch two months ago, so we don't have the stories um, that she shared, but uh, we have 35 reforestation projects from all over the world. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of projects in the pipeline. Um, we have projects that are a couple of hectares big, some that are tens of thousands of hectares. And as it's strange as it may sound, we're really proud of the small and medium-sized projects because if it wasn't for us, they wouldn't have started in the first place. Um, and just to remind you, in the legacy approach, you usually need a massive tract of land usually over 1,000 hectares in order to get started with reforestation. Uh, but yeah, with us, there's no, no minimal limit. Um, and yeah, we already seen an impact. Um, a lot of the land that is being reforested as we speak would have been barren otherwise. Um, and most of our projects uh, come from developing countries. We have about four or five projects with indigenous people uh, and seeing how these people can access a steady stream of income is, I would say, is the most gratifying part of the, part of the job. Uh, and as for the future, well, <laughs> there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of opportunities that we see. Right now, we're only doing reforestation, afforestation, but there are a lot of other activities that can benefit the environment and that have a market for uh, and that need measurement and verification. Um, so things like conservation, biodiversity, and mangroves. I know you especially are a, <laughs> a big fan of mangroves. Um, we, we can build those verticals on top of the existing uh, OFP platform, but the great thing is it doesn't have to be only OFP. It could be we welcome all entrepreneurs who are passionate about the environment to create, to create these solutions and use our core validation engine. So I would say as for the future, this more collaborative open approach is the way forward, um, not only for OFP, but for other Web3 projects that aim to do social good. Radical collaboration. That's, that's really, that's the, the name of the game for the future. Well, with the final question for Kalpana, is if removing ourselves from communities and zooming back in on ourselves as individuals, how can we, so each one of us leaving this room, how can, what can we think about to have a better relationship, more connected relationship with nature and technology? I'll say three things. Um, <laughs> one is just as an individual, make sure you push corporations to place people and planet over profits. Also, um, Within Web3 and NFT technologies, um, we all love data and numbers. Um, but don't forget that you are interacting with living entities that have a life force within them. And you should connect to that because you're not just helping you know, X amount of a thousand communities around the world. You are helping to grow living trees, living creatures that are all connected to a much 
bigger ecosystem that you're also a part of. Um, and then my last sort of tip would be to connect to your local community, but also your non-human community. So try to connect to the green spaces that are around you, the trees, the biodiversity, the soil. Um, it's all really a deep part of this network that is helping to build for a flourishing future. And we need to think about how we can give nature a voice within that. Thank you. Yeah, I, f I feel that having more awareness ar about what's around you and, and kind of paying attention to it is, is key. Like, for example, watering some of the plants that are drying out during a heat wave, something very simple you can do, and hug a tree. <laughs> well, uh, well, that's it from all the questions. So I think uh, we might be able to wrap up here. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, if anybody has any questions, please come talk to us. If you know any landowners, please come talk to us. Uh, and hug a tree. Do you have any questions? Or do we have time for questions? Anybody have a question? Andrew, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you so much for this topic. I uh, uh, like some video photo I make if you wanna. I can send after uh, if you'd like. Uh, let's speak about how you uh, would like to engage audience by marketing instrument because I work with marketing Web3 and I'm interested in like your ideas, how you will engage audience for uh, like which type of marketing or message for uh, think about climate, for think about this topic. Maybe it's my question. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I have a lot of ideas and some of the things, you know, in my experience, I've done, a, I started doing a lot of this work because I personally faced, saw this natural degradation and seeing pictures of it, being in it, like talking to local people about what's going on and why, that was extremely shocking when I did that. You know, in the city, you don't see anything. You see news and stats, you know, and you're like, oh, there's someone flooding over there and fire over here. But if you are placed in that environment or it's the familiar environments that you like that are suffering, then you become emotionally moved. And my answer, as a, also a marketer myself, my answer is you got to connect with people at the heart, you know, to make behavior change, you got to ignite their imaginations. And that happens through very emotional visuals and stories and narratives, in my opinion. Hello, um, I have a question. My question is a little bit in response to kind of what you just said and your three points that you outlined. Because the trouble with this subject, and I'm fascinated by this subject, but the trouble with it is I feel like there are, there are many contradictions at play. So for example, your first point uh, you know, is the individual putting pressure on corporations to not put profits first. But in, in essence, that's business is for profit. And, and so that will never happen, and, and in, in a sense. And so you, you have non-profit, hence the name. And so, so it's a little contradiction. And the, the other one is um, this idea around um, technology um, and the fact that we're racing towards the metaverse. Um, and then your third point, which was going out to nature, which I think is actually the number one thing that people can do, which is just connect to nature. Hugging trees is, might get you hit on the street, but anyway. And so my question is, 
and then in response to your point about the narratives and um, positive narratives, etc., and you got, you mentioned the doom and gloom, and I'm trying to connect all of these points that you've said to get to my final question, which, and you said it, Stephen, in your opening around getting people to care about something that's perceived to be so far away, right, is difficult. So then the question for you all is, what role do you think incentive systems play, which is, for me, is economics 101, is like, in helping people understand or get involved in this space because I would argue that positive images of people hugging trees is not going to make the average Joe give a shit, pardon my French. And so, um, in, in, and you know, being a DeFi native here in crypto and my, I'm passionate about that space, how do we pay people to care? <laughs> I can try to answer it just very briefly. Um, well, one is, you know, what is money on a dead planet? That would be my <laughs> first kind of thought. <laughs> Not to doom and gloom, but I think, um, I think there's these two coinciding narratives that are running along, um, and we need to realize that they're actually the same narrative, and it's about how we tell this story to ourselves. The fact that technology and our progress is, it doesn't mean that it's against nature. It's actually for nature. And the deepest form of technology is within a, lot, within a lot of natural processes that we can find. So connecting to the, the space, there's this term actually, you might like it, it's called technobiophilia, which means that the technologies that we create have a natural tendency to be for nature, because as humans, that is the space where we thrive the most. Um, so for me, it's about like reshifting that narrative into how can we as humans progress within this kind of like technological innovations while still loving and holding space for nature? I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything to that. I would, yep. I would just say that in terms of incentives, having market incentives is, is a very powerful tool uh, because you can rely on the goodwill of people and that kind of drives, that starts the whole uh, market-driven mechanism but when you set the right incentives in place, I think you can get tremendous results. And of course, these results can be aimed for something that's detrimental and something that's beneficial. So I don't think we should look at it at such a critical lens, um, uh, having market incentives. Um, uh, I'm specifically talking about trading carbon, for example, and there are many, um, let's say, problems with this industry, but I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think we should reform it. I think we should set the right safeguards in place so, these in, so it doesn't turn into perverse incentives. So that's, that's what I think. Okay. Yeah. One, one person agrees. Um, yeah, it's a... you, you're sending me home. Okay. This guy gets it, or, or girl, I don't know. <laughs> They're kicking us off stage. Let's talk after.